Hello again and welcome to the Master's Voice. I'm Celestial and you're welcome to this channel. To old and new subscribers alike, you're very welcome. The prophecy that I have today is touching on prophetic truths, long established prophetic truths that can be found in the word of God. One of them is from the book of Revelation chapter 11 and the other one is from Matthew 24. So I'm going to read the Matthew 24 scripture as the overarching banner scripture for this message. And Matthew 24 states in verses six and seven, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So Matthew 24 is a long established end times chapter. That is one of the chapters that gives one of the clearest understandings of what the people of God are to expect and are to be well taught about, well prepped about concerning what types of times are going to come to the earth, what types of things are going to be taking place in our midst before we see, before we meet the Lord at his glorious coming. And so it's talking about hearing of wars and rumors of wars. And it says that the people of God, Jesus was telling his disciples that when you hear about wars and there's rumors that war is coming, that you should not be troubled because you should already know that all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So right there, the Lord of the harvest, the Lord Jesus Christ, our eternal Lord and savior is trying to put us in a proper mindset. That's telling us that when we hear that there's rumors, that their war is going to be established here, or that kingdom is going to rise against kingdom or nation rise against a nation, we should not have our hearts be troubled. And why does he say that? He says, for all these things have to come to pass. These things have to happen, but they are not signaling that the immediate time of the end is here. And in verse eight, he explains why. He says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So beginning of sor sorrows then signifies for us that there will be an onset period during which very painful things, very hurtful things, very hard things are going to be experienced. Not only will kingdom rise against kingdom, nation against nation, we will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but the scripture also says that we will experience famines, pestilences and earthquakes will happen in various places. And yet Jesus lumps all these definitely fearful things together and says that we should not be troubled by them because they are only the beginning of sorrows. And so there you have the banner scripture. And now I will just share a series of dreams that I had. The title of this prophecy is the judgment of the wicked. And I had this series of dreams very early today, April the 14th, 2024, April the 14th, 2024. And so the first one is about what is in revelation 11. The Lord spoke to me in my dream and very clearly said the following. It is while they are still rejoicing that I will destroy them. It is while they are laughing. It is while they are saying, finally, at last, that is when they will re I will relieve them of their position in this earth. When they are happy, when they are relieved and they don't have a care in the world, when they are saying, finally, at last, we are free of them. We are rid of them. They don't have life anymore and can no longer bother us. Then the Lord said, that is when I will uproot wickedness from the earth and plant righteousness in its place. They will not survive because of rejoicing over the mighty. Whoever rejoices when the greater falls, the Lord will judge him. This is the word of the Lord. So this is how the dream started. The dream started with the Lord speaking and telling me that he was going to destroy a particular bunch of people and that he was going to destroy them at their highest moment, at their peak moments, when they were in the middle of rejoicing over something that they thought they were free of. They were rejoicing and they were laughing and they were saying, finally, finally, we're free of someone. We're free of them. 
They don't have life in them anymore. They can no longer bother us. And God says that while the laughter of these people who are rejoicing over the fall of someone else, while the laughter is still in their mouth, that is when he's going to destroy them. That's when he's going to uproot them utterly out of the earth. That's when he's going to bring them to the end of their life. And he said that he will do it because they were rejoicing over the mighty. They are rejoicing over the greater ones. They are rejoicing over clearly people or persons or a person that God sets high above the ones who are mocking them, rejoicing over people that God esteems as greater. He called them the mighty. He called them the greater. And he said that whoever rejoices over the mighty, whoever rejoices when the greater falls, the Lord will judge him. He will not survive. This is the word of the Lord. And so please hear this dream because this dream was taking place in a time period that it's, well, it's still earth. It's still our world, but it was taking place at a time that definitely had to be in the future because of how the people were, were, and because of just how the general society was. So what I saw is I saw that somebody very holy had died. Whoever had died, this person was magnificently holy and this person died. And it was in the future, sometime from now, and I don't know what had happened to the world, even though you have many clues as to what will cause our world to change here on the Master's Prophecy blog, the Master's Voice Prophecy blog. You have multiple prophecies that are very in-depth of telling you how the world that you occupy today is going to look, act, and behave nothing like the kingdom that is ahead, the kingdom of the beast, the beast system. So whatever it is that had happened, the world had absolutely changed. It was nothing like I remembered it. It was so advanced that you could not keep up with it. I mean, head turningly advanced. And yet, as I sit here now today, I cannot tell you a single, a single distinguishing feature from that world. So I can't exactly tell you, oh, it was because I saw this or, oh, it was because they were doing that and that at that time. It was just it was just mind blowing how advanced that world was. And yet the quality of the people in that world had deteriorated to such an extent that it would take your breath away. People were so wicked, breathtakingly wicked. I'm speaking of a level that we are not yet exposed to today with all the heinous crimes and all the things that are happening, that level of wickedness, It was beyond what we're used to today. That level of wickedness is the kind that will make you wish that you had never been born. You would wish not to see daylight. You would wish not to exist. You would wish that you had never come to life such that you would end up living at a time where people were capable of doing what they were doing at that time. They did their activities freely. They did their activities without remorse. They did their activities in public. And nobody berated them and nobody complained about what they were doing. So it was a time when society was just completely amoral. Society was immoral. Society was irreparably fallen. And yet the people in the society did not subject themselves to any form of censure. No one complained. There was nowhere that people went and said, I'm sorry, but so-and-so is doing this. So-and-so is doing this with a dog in the street. So-and-so is doing this with a child in the street. People were absolutely inured to it. It was life and they were happy in it. They reveled in it because the primary characteristic of the people in this dream was how much they laughed. These people laughed as if they were being paid to laugh. These people, I can only say that they had mastered crystallized mockery and scoffing. Everything was funny to them. The laughter that these people were laughing, it really put me in mind of these old style Victorian English movies where there's a king and a queen and a court and everything like that. And sometimes there's this one person who's at the outskirts of the society, someone who used to be high up, but has now fallen upon hard times, spends all their time using acidic, acidic wit, spend all their time tearing down the king and the queen in their commentary, always drunk, obviously bitter. And when any character goes to interact with this person, they always have this laugh like, (laughs) that shows that the mind is not okay. 
they have this slightly on edge, crazy laugh that shows you all is not well with this person. I think that there could be something deeper going on. So people were constantly laughing in this society. And this thing had the final effect of making God so enraged when they took it too far in what they did. They laughed a lot. These people, all they did was to laugh and to mock and be coquettes or coquettes is an old fashioned English word. That means that someone is overly sexual. Someone is overly flirtatious. Someone is overly concerned with looking and acting and carrying themselves in such a way as to stir up sexual desire and sexual interest in others who are looking at them or others who are interacting with them. So in this society, mockery, sex, and pleasure was all they had on their minds. That's all they were seeking. Where's my next high? Where's my next sexual partner? Who can I tear down? Who can I make fun of? Who can I belittle? Who can I, uh, who can I amuse myself with until the next interesting thing comes along? These people were insanely bored. And the reason is because in this society, the government was providing them money to do everything that they wanted to do. Everything was government subsidized. This futuristic society, you'd think that with so much futuristic tech, so much technology, so much social advancement available and the government providing things for people, you would think that it would somehow make people better people, but instead they devolved and they turned into the lowest form of humanity that I had ever seen. Being next to them for me was intolerable. I hated being in that society for the time that I was there walking around and forced to interact with people. I hated those people. And being in that time period was insufferable. And then somebody died. And the person who died, I don't know who it was, but somebody known, a known religious figure died. I couldn't see who it was. It was not revealed to me, but I know that the general response when that person died was joy and relief. People were so happy. The relief that came upon the society when this religious person was taken away, when this person died, it was palpable relief. You could almost hear the collective sigh coming out of the society. It was as if finally, finally, oh my goodness, we are free of this person. I'm talking about a humongous relief that was felt internationally. Way more people around the world were happy about this death than only here in America. It seems that all around the world, everybody had the same feelings and the same viewpoint towards this person. And when that person finally died, the way that people were happy, people began to laugh. They laughed at the news of the death. They rejoiced when this person died and they began to make a lot of orders on the internet. So they began to put in a lot of internet orders, a lot of online buying, and I will get to it quickly to let you know what they were buying when this death happened and seeing the general response in society. I was, I was honestly confused. I was confused, but very quickly I began to hate these people for the way that they were responding to the death of a holy person. They were saying, finally, finally capital letters for three long years, they have tortured our souls calling on the name of Jesus for three long years. They have been going everywhere, preaching the gospel and tormenting us with their faith. Finally, though, it's over. It's done. They're gone. We can breathe again. <laughs> and good riddance. <laughs> so everywhere, this was the general consensus that we're free of this, this person. We've suffered under the yoke of this person for three long years. Everywhere you look, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Everywhere you look, they're tormenting us with this name, Jesus, but they're finally dead and we can breathe again and good riddance. And these people began to send gifts to one another gifts as much as anyone could afford, whatever your pocket could afford. It ranged from humble gifts, gifts of flowers, gifts of fruit. It was mostly food that I saw being shared. They began to send gifts to one another, fruit baskets and something called exotic chocolate grapes. Exotic chocolate grapes was a big order that people were putting in online. They began to send each other wines according to different price. They began to send each other silks and materials, small tokens and large extravagant tokens. They sent each other care baskets 
and they exchanged phone numbers so that they could talk about this death more. And the whole time that this was happening down on the ground in this society that I was looking at above. So just imagine you're having a very wide angle view of a city or a society at the bottom. And then you can also see the sky and the landscape at the back. There was a massive, humongous, threatening black cloud building up in the background of this dream. So this cloud was, you could almost say it was rising up from ground level and then just looming, 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 filling the sky. And the people were oblivious to that black cloud building up like a menace over their entire society. None of them saw it, but I saw the cloud. They were too busy on the phone laughing about the death of this religious figure. And here are some of the things they say. They said, so-and-so was such a dastardly individual, weren't they? Such a dastardly individual. And then the other person would say, yes, they were an absolute sulfuric torment to my soul. Sulfuric torment, meaning they literally felt like a demon to me coming from the sulfurous flames of hell to torment the souls of people such as ourselves. Didn't you just hate them? And then the other person on the phone call would say, yes, I hated them so much. They were intolerable. And then the other person would agree and say, yes, 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 yes. I hated them dearly, but I also feared them because they had superpowers from God. I was afraid of them, you know, my dear. But now we don't have to be afraid anymore because they're dead. <laughs> and so this is the type of conversation that was taking place just internationally. People were expressing how relieved they were. And so in the middle of these phone calls, seeing all these different people so relieved that somebody defined as mighty and greater, who also had divine powers from God had died. The Lord spoke from that future time. The Lord was in that big black cloud, by the way. He was the one who was looming and rising over that society and they did not perceive him at all. The Lord spoke out of that future time, out of that cloud, and it traveled to me. So I saw myself sleeping on my bed and the message of the Lord traveled and came to me in my sleep. And he said, tell them that I will destroy them because they have hated the just and rejoiced at the death of the righteous. I will not tolerate a nesting evil. I will wipe the earth clean of its inhabitants while they are still celebrating and exclaiming freedom from the Lord, I will strike them and take away their lives. So I woke up to record this dream. I had multiple dreams last night, but not all of them can I remember. So I woke up to record this dream and the two scriptures that immediately came upon my heart were Exodus chapter 32 and Revelation chapter 11 verses 3 to 11. So let us start. A general, um, a general understanding of Exodus 32 is at this point, Moses has been on the mountain for quite a while. So they're in the Exodus, they're free of Pharaoh and his oppression. And they've come, they've worshiped the Lord at Mount Sinai, and then they've camped at the base. And then Moses tells them that the Lord has called him up into a more private council. And he's going up on the mountain to worship before the Lord and to hear what the Lord has to say to him. And he's also going to receive the law of the Lord. And so Moses goes up and Joshua, his young companion, his little mentee in training goes up with him and the people are left on the ground. And please bear in mind that the people are only left alone and they have multiple leaders, all the leaders of the father's houses, the elders and everything. It's not as if they were left without supervision. Aaron, the high priest, Moses gave him authority, delegated authority to him, thinking this is the high priest, what could go wrong. And as we all know, Aaron, with the enticement of the people, built them a God because they said, well, where is this Moses who has brought us out of captivity? They build a golden calf and they are worshiping it. And they're saying, behold, our God who brought us out of Egypt, our God who saved us. And God up on that mountain becomes infuriated. He burns with fury and he tells Moses, go get ye down to your people that you brought out of the wilderness. For see, they have defiled and contaminated themselves. They have built for themselves a golden calf and they're in the process of worshiping it. And so horrified, Moses comes rushing down, carrying with him the two tablets upon which he's carrying the commandments and everything like that. And when he gets down and he sees what the people are doing, 
which is described as eating and drinking. And then the people rose up to play. I'll explain that in a moment. When he sees what the people are doing, Moses is so enraged. The first thing he does is smash the commandments on the ground. He is so angry and to shorten everything, Moses questions his brother and his brother lies about the reason why there is now an idol in the camp. And so Moses says, who's with me? Who is on the Lord's side? One of the most iconic displays of righteousness, one of the most iconic displays of loyalty to God above all things. Moses cries out, who's with, who is on the Lord's side? And all the Levites respond. So not everybody in the camp was participating in that debauchery. Rose up to play means it's a state where people have satisfied all basic needs. Hungry people are very different from people who have had the full, a full meal. Hungry people behave differently. They're quieter. They're a lot more humble. They are, they are a lot more meek than people whose bellies are full. When people's bellies are full, these are primal needs, eating and drinking. When these things have been satisfied, the next step for human beings naturally is to look for amusement. People want to amuse themselves. They want to play games. They want to watch TV. They want to go and look at art. They want to do different things because they're no longer hungry. They've satisfied the body. So now they want to satisfy different urges and things like that. And rose up to play in this case carries sexual connotations with it. The people began to do all kinds of immorality in the open, in the camp, within sight of the mountain, where 40 days prior, this is only a month and a half or a month and a little bit, they had been told to absolutely strip themselves of all their Egyptian things that they had and to consecrate themselves to make themselves holy because God was going to come down on the mountain to meet them. So within sight of the place of consecration, they then began to contaminate and defile themselves. And the Lord was very angry with those people. The last verse in Exodus chapter two says, and the Lord plagued the people because of what they, they had done with the golden calf. And so that is one of the scriptures that came on my heart when I woke up from a dream in which God was saying that because people were so immoral and they had lost all sense of morality, that they were laughing, mocking, and enjoying themselves at the death of a very, very powerful religious figure in those days who was powerfully preaching the gospel and moving in dedicated signs and wonders, but also something that they termed superpowers from God, divine superpowers from God, then uh, that is why the Lord said that he was going to kill them while the laughter was still in their mouth. And now we can go to Revelation chapter 11 and see what is written there. And I'm going to pick it up from verse three. And it reads, and I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud and their enemies saw them. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake and a 10th of the city fell. 
In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So I'm ending here at verse 14. And so you're hearing a long-standing as not yet fulfilled biblical prophecy about the coming of two witnesses that God will send with a very powerful word of prophecy in their mouth. And the Lord says that these two witnesses will prophesy for 1,260 days and they will be wearing sackcloth. And they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands and they stand before the God of the whole earth. And these two people, the Bible says, you can't harm them because fire, it's not the metaphorical fire that the pastors have taught because the Bible will say something blunt as anything. And then people will go up on the pulpit and they will start to turn it to analogies and they will start to turn it to metaphors and they will start to turn it into everything that it is. And they do not understand that when you water down the word of God, you may attempt to strip the word of God of power, but God will never allow his word to be watered down because God's word is sharper than a double-edged sword. You cannot play with the word of God because immediately you start to play with the word of God, guess what the effect is? You pervert the word of God. You are going to produce a contaminated understanding and a contaminated faith in the people who hear the perverted version that you are teaching. And this is why there is so much unnecessary confusion about the two witnesses. Many people in America hold the belief that the two witnesses represent two groups of people. That is erroneous teaching. The same way that it's erroneous teaching to think that the 144,000 are some spiritual mass of people that somehow, because it's a spiritual number, it contains more people than what it says in the scripture. It is very clear that the Bible says that these are two prophets, two physical human beings, one, two, not two groups, not two entities, not, oh, it's the oil church and the wine church. Oh no, it's the church and Israel. America is full of so much corrupted doctrine. And that's why the people have corrupted faith, corrupted thinking and corrupted expectations about what the end time is going to contain. But I thank God for championing his word because he still has pastors out there who preach the truth. The Bible says very clearly, let's read verse 10 again. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and they will make merry and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. These are two prophetic messengers coming with a very powerful word of prophecy that they're going to prophesy for a thousand days. 260 days and they're going to be wearing sackcloth. They're going to be in a very humbled posture. They're going to be in a humbled posture. The sackcloth, it may be physical sackcloth, but it definitely will be represented of people who will be moving in very powerful and dynamic ministry with the kind of mouth that John the Baptist had. These are two people. It's not the church. It's not the oil. It's not the wine. It's not the pancake batter. It's what the Bible says. And the sooner that we come out of, oh, but I always thought, oh, but I heard it on the so-called podcast. And oh, it's always been taught in my generation like that. It's only two people and they're going to be carrying supernatural power of God. And because of their submitted and surrendered nature to the Lord, this power is going to be powerful enough to emit itself in the form of fire. God says that if anyone tries to harm the two witnesses during their consecrated and covered period of prophesying to the whole earth, they're going to be greeted with fire out of the mouth of these prophets. This is not metaphorical fire. The prophets are not going to say in the name of Jesus, I speak to you a fiery end. It's going to be actual fire because where are we? We are in the time where we are no longer limited by what Christians can believe. And I really thank God for that. It's been so stifling and it's been so terrible to have to live in the midst of people who think that the limitations of this supernatural book where people are walking dry shod across open, open, open seas where people are fighting lions and killing them with their bare hands, where people are killing, the Bible says that Samson killed 1,000 Philistines and all he used 
was the jawbone of a donkey. He had a bone. And the Bible says that that man, that that man from the Bible was so powerful that he was able to kill 1,000 fighting men. And the Philistines were no slouch in the field. They were very aggressive military people. But so, um, Samson was able to take on a thousand of them by himself using just a piece of bone. And then it also says in another place that I think it's the same passage that after he had fought them, he was very tired. He was very faint and he wanted water and he couldn't find any. And then he cried out to God in a complaint and he said, but what is this? You raised me up to defend Israel and I have fought this mighty battle. And now am I supposed to die of thirst? And then the Bible says a spring appeared right there. The ground literally opened up and water began to come out. But modern people reading it will then try to say, no, it was probably, it was probably a Norwegian hidden spring that was there all along. And he probably hadn't seen it. People like to undermine God's power so much. And this is why the power of God does not work in the lives of most Christians. Most Christians are unaware that they are in stagnant sin called unbelief. They don't believe anything. The primary thing that comes out of the mouth of people who say that they're saved is, but what about this? Okay, but what about that? You answer them on that point and they will say, okay, okay, okay. But then what about this? That's not indicating a hard posture that actually wants to move in faith and believes God. That's a fact checking heart. That's the disease that the modern day church has. It's a fact checking heart. It's not enough to read the scripture and let it be what it says. We need to reinterpret it. We need to spin it now because now we need to have the top trending podcast that is taking a different, more incisive look at something that is actually very simple. It says here in the scripture, verse five, if anybody tries to harm these two people, not the oil and the wine and the two spiritual groups, two physical people, that's two sets of arms, two bodies, two sets of feet, two faces, only two. It says that fire will come out of their mouth and eats up their enemies. And notice that it's not metaphorical fire because the Bible then goes on to clarify and emphasize what it just says. It repeats, if anyone tries to harm them, he must be killed in this matter, in this manner. Metaphorical words, sharp words, even a sharp rebuke of prophecy cannot kill you. It says, if you raise your hand against these people, you will die because fire will emit out of them and consume you. It also goes on to say that these two witnesses can shut up the heavens. This is the same power that Elijah had to stop up the rain, no rain. Elijah called for the drought and there was no rain in Israel for three whole years. God is the one who had to intervene because the Bible does not show us at any point that Elijah went back and said, okay, Lord, it's been a long time enough. I think the rain should come back. No, Elijah had every right to call for the drought because one of the punishments that God pronounced at the raising up of Solomon's, at the raising up of the temple was that if anyone should sin in the land, if anyone should walk in sin, if Israel should turn away as one man and begin to worship idols and false gods and things like that, God said that he would shut up the heaven. He told Solomon to his face, I will shut up the heaven against you. And so Elijah, knowing that, was fully within his right to call for a drought and the heavens were shut up. And these two people will be able to call for drought and no rain will fall in the days of their prophecy. So the entire earth is going to be, please listen, struggling ag agriculturally while these people are prophesying. They're going to stop up the rain, which means lakes everywhere are going to be drying up. Rivers and fresh springs are going to be drying up. There's going to be a struggle for water. And how many times have I prophesied here in the old prophecy, such as the loss of the sea? I think that was one of them. And the other prophecy is called future events and something like that. Future events where I said that water is going to dry up so much. And then on top of that, the star from the book of Revelation, Wormwood, which I saw was actually a person, a fallen angel, falls into the water and all the water became bitter. And there was such a water shortage at that time that knowing that the water was bitter as wormwood and poisonous, people still drank it and died. And I made sure to clarify in the prophecy, do you know how desperate the times have to be for you to know that water is poisoned and be thirsty enough to go and still drink that poison? Those are dire times, terrible times. 
And these people will be causing nations to struggle. They will be causing nations to have terrible harvests, nations to go dry, nations that are landlocked that don't have access to perhaps lots of lakes or rivers or things like that. They depend on their neighbors. I've spoken this before. And I said, you're landlocked and you're depending on your neighbor for water. And then there's drought. The earth is dry. Your neighbor is immediately going to prioritize the water needs of his own population. He's not going to be thinking about pumping water in any kind of water pipeline to you anymore. You become second, third, or even fifth priority and making sure that his nation stays functional. Maybe they even use the rain and the water for hydroelectric, but when there's no rain, the rivers are dried up. The rivers don't have enough power to power turbines and things like that. And then you begin to have power cuts and things like that. These people made life very difficult for the population. When you look at the Bible, you have to think about what is written there, and then you will, the Holy Spirit will give you a better understanding. So they have the power to turn waters to blood, no rain falling, turning waters to blood. This is the plagues of the Exodus. This was, I think the second plague that the waters turned to blood. This is the kind of power they will have. This is not metaphorical. I have prophesied here that all the 10 plagues will come back and they will be seen in various parts of the world, God will perform all 10, the darkness, all the way to the harsh and horrible one, which is the death of the firstborn will be seen again. And it says that they also have the power to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. So they travel to your nation. They come to Denmark or where people have the red light district. I think that's where they have it. And bestiality is not frowned upon in, in some of those Nordic countries. And they come there and there's nothing you can do to stop them coming there because they are covered by the Lord and they have the right to prophesy for that time. And they begin to say, hear the word of the Lord, you that love animals and you that are unmerciful toward the Lord and things like that. You that have no love for the truth of God, there shall be no rain. They shut up heaven. They turn the water to blood. They call maybe for a blight on the harvest. It says that they can strike the earth with all plagues. How many plagues does the Bible cover? The Bible covers cannibalism, famine and starving until the point where you eat your child. Afflictions, boils, sudden wasting diseases. It says in Exodus 32, and the Lord plagued the people because of what they had done. It doesn't even tell us what plague he sent among them at the very end of the Exodus, at the very end of um, Exodus chapter 32 to plague them. It just says that he plagued them. You can be plagued with an affliction in the body. The Philistines, when they dared to touch and handle the ark, they were plagued with hemorrhoids. All of them, all of them, the Bible says, were plagued with hemorrhoids. And so... These are two people that will have supernatural powers, but it says that at the time they finish testifying, the beast is going to come out of the bottomless pit to fight against them. And when they come to the end of their prophetic ministry, the Lord says that he will indeed allow the beast to fight them, overcome them, and to kill them. And their dead bodies are going to be laying in the street. And here is a very telling verse that matches exactly this dream. It says that when the people, this is verse nine, when those people, tribes, tongues, and nations shall see their dead bodies three and a half days, they will not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. So there's no way that you torment us. There's no way that you come and preach, repent of your sins, but we're debauched. We're wicked. We're falling. We don't want to repent of our sins. And now we're going to just quickly bury you. Oh no, 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 no. You're going to lay there so that we can laugh the laugh that celestial just described in this dream. You're going to lay there in the open so that every, every news outlet in the world can send reporters quickly to the scene to film you, to reassure the people back in their country that these two witnesses have indeed died. Remember in revelation 13, it says something very telling. It says who can make war with the beast? And it says that all the world wondered after the beast. So when the beast comes up like a jack in a box, unable to get himself fried during the time that they're covered by God for prophecy, when that time period 
where no one can prevail against them is over. That's when the beast, who also knows how to read the Bible and understand prophetic timing. Satan is literally, Satan, the dragon, the beast, we all know who he is, are literally going to count from the first time that they're seen preaching in public and just count the 1,000 days and tolerate them tolerate them for 1,260 days. And at the end of that time, he's simply going to ascend because he now knows according to scripture, the moratorium that protects them, it's over. They no longer have divine protection. They're fair game. And he's going to attack them and kill them and their bodies will lay there. And what does verse 10 say? That people will start rejoicing. People will be so relieved. It says, people will rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts to one another because of these two prophets who tormented those who dwell on the earth. Remember, somebody on the phone call says, they are, this person who has died is a sulfuric torment to us. So the wicked will always perceive the preaching of righteousness as the voice of hell. I'm well acquainted with that. The more I speak the prophetic word of God, the more it is called doom and gloom and lies. Doom and gloom is the term that adults who claim that they read their Bible are giving prophecies that line up with and match and explain and open up prophetic things that I guarantee you the majority of pastors have not stood up on their pulpit to speak for years and years and years. People call it fear mongering. They call it doom and gloom. And so it shall be. So that is the dream that I had that somebody died, somebody very mighty, somebody very holy, somebody moving in supernatural power, and people were afraid of them. Listen to this. Yes, yes, I hated them dearly, but I also feared them because they had superpowers from God. I was afraid of them. But now we don't have to be afraid anymore because they're dead, followed by the unstable laughter and mockery. And so God says that because people are nesting evil, He's going to wipe the earth clean of its inhabitants. And it will happen at the time when they are most celebratory and they're exclaiming freedom. We're free from God. We're free from God's messengers. He said, I will strike them right then and take away their lives. And you hear here that these people, these two witnesses are brought back to God. I mean, the text is so clear. I truly don't understand how pastors have gotten away with telling the church that these are groups of people. And I honestly don't understand why the church who is supposed to be taking responsibility for their own faith. How can you believe that these are large groups of people such as the church? Oh, and the other person, the other witnesses, Israel, how can you believe for it to be mass groups of people when it's talking about two struck two fall dead. And then God raises them up and puts the breath of nose, the breath of life back into two noses. How does someone convince you that these are groups of people? Is it possible for, for masses such as the Christian church and another mass such as Israel to prophesy and mass and to be coherent? Is it, pro is it possible for the church as a unit to all prophesy when the Bible in Apostle Paul's own words, he said, do all prophesy. And he immediately gave the answer in case someone would get confused. He said, no, can all prophesy? No. So why would we believe that two, just two sent to do prophetic ministry are now groups of people? The mind boggles. And so God will raise these people up and he will kill their tormentors. And then the next dream that I saw, I went back to sleep and I saw the sky begin to do that flickering like that is indicative of rapid warfare and bombs. I was in the Middle East and the sky was lighting up. And sometimes you would see an air an, an aircraft go zoom, zoom through that lighting up sky. I was watching it from a very safe distance. I was watching it happen. Um, you know, sometimes when they're shelling, not where you are, but over there and they're shooting and then the sky is lighting up. So sometimes the sky would light up with violet, but I think it was reflecting over, it was reflecting the, the color of the clouds, very dark clouds in the sky because it was at night. So the sky would light up and it would be different shades of lavender and purple and, and deep blues. But other times the flares or whatever was happening would be bright orange and red and sometimes with streaks of white in there and it was such serious fighting please listen it was so much serious fighting going on in the middle east that even those people who have appointed themselves the ones who always say 
normally this and that and we'll keep observing the situation but at this time it is normal for that region those people had their mouths shut those who normally say this is just a skirmish this is normal for the middle east this is a normal rise in tensions and this is just an expected escalation because of this and that and that i saw that those people were confused at how gung-ho that fighting became out there and so they didn't say anything some of them were at a total loss for words and some of them were finding it a little difficult to speak they were finding it a little difficult to express what was happening so you come on the show you're a political analyst you're an expert but they didn't quite know what to say and then i also saw a picture of the arab societies and for some reason the men in the arab societies were very busy i saw them walking in airports and i saw them walking in other places they were walking along thoroughfares and everything and i saw them in the traditional white garb that's held with the black cord and also the thing with the black cord um the head covering that they had uh for for now the name escapes me that's held with that black cord I saw these men um, walking with purpose. They were walking purposely. Some of them were in airports and they were walking around. And the word Eid, Eid Mubarak came to my spirit. So the word Eid Mubarak came to me in the dream. And the Lord spoke to me in the dream and he said, this will be their last peaceful Eid Mubarak in a while they will not be able to make this observance in peace for a long time after this because a war will come to their region i continue there is a war in the middle east coming that is beyond anything that anyone expected that is because the multiple efforts to foster peace that have been very widely publicized have been done by various leaders, including Western leaders, who have spearheaded these peacekeeping deals. They really believe that they have done something or they have done or established work in the peacekeeping deals that would endure, but they have not addressed the real problem, which is the power imbalance in the region. The Lord further went on to say, that the power imbalance in the region is caused by Israel and it is further complicated by the presence of the United States in that area. Because of this, the true root of contention has never actually been touched. And as a result of this, tensions and tempers will fly off the hook in a global war that is brewing before us all. Just a moment, please. So what the Lord is telling us is that what is going on in the Middle East is not what we may be hearing through our media. It's not what we may be used to hearing from political experts and analysts who have traditionally watched the situation of instability in the Middle East with Israel at the core of it flare up multiple times, so many times in past history. The Lord says that we should not be fooled. We should not be confused because this time the, con the conflict is going to be, it's going to escalate out of hand to the point that these Arab societies are going to be highly mobilized. They're going to suddenly become extremely busy. I expect we will see large movements of people, probably affluent people at first, because affluent people are always the first to see which way the wind is blowing and start moving. But we can expect to see the Arab societies start to be highly mobilized, especially the men. And God says that the people in that region have just had their last peaceful Eid because... They won't be able to make this observance in future in full peace because war is coming to that region. And people who usually comment on this, those who give the commentary, those who make the observation and things like that, they are used to seeing these peacekeeping deals spearheaded by various leaders. And usually the most publicized ones are the ones that have the Western leaders at the helm. But every time these Western leaders come to spearhead deals, the deals are not enduring. The peace that they come to foster never addresses the real problem at the crux of why there's so much instability there. And God says that the imbalance in that region is being caused by Israel. And the situation is further complicated by the very open support that the United States gives Israel as an ally. And so because the true reason for all the fighting and all the instability, all the tensions and all the temper, because the true root of the contention is never addressed. So never, no one actually ever just says, 
Israel is doing this and then the Western leaders or all parties can at least take an objective look at it because there's been traditionally this strong support of Israel. And here in the United States, you cannot speak about Israel. You cannot speak about the state of Israel. You cannot speak about Jews in the United States without inviting terrible backlash. And then on top of that, you're dealing with a highly brainwashed population that whether they know it or not, they've been brainwashed from the top down who have told them that Israel is not to be touched. Israel is not to be criticized. And when anyone in the general population or anyone who is in a position of power or anyone anywhere within our borders begins to speak, especially in a public way, in a public platform that is seen as anti-Israel, anti the goals of Israel or anti the seemingly untouchable rights of the state of Israel to do whatever it wants, then whatever you say is automatically branded as anti-Semitic. So it doesn't necessarily have to be anti-Semitic, especially when it's not ad hominem and it's not speaking about them in their personal capacity. No, the general bottom line is that we as a population are not allowed to speak about the state of Israel, leaders of Israel, the agenda of Israel, the strategies of Israel, past history of Israel, anything you say. So you can comment about the history of Asians. You can comment about black people. You can comment about white people. You can comment about Attila the Hun. The minute you mention Israel, you are labeled with that tag anti-Semitic. And there comes a powerful unseen force. There comes powerful lobbying groups to shut you down and vilify you and call you all sorts of names. And that has been the standard, but it is a mercy for us that the Holy spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ has entered the conversation because now, as you will hear, as I continue, God says that he's going to put everything on front street. God says that he's going to put everything out in the open. And this is why we give thanks to God for the true prophetic word. The true prophetic word is coming from the expression of the Holy spirit himself. So this is basically God telling us what's in God's personal notebook. What is on God's agenda? What is step three, step five, and step 15 that the Lord Yah himself is going to take? It doesn't need the buy-in of people. You can't label God anti-Semitic because it's simply impossible. His word is law and he's going to settle all matters in a way that human commentary, one person cannot be accused. Oh, you hate Israel. Oh, you're pro this or you're anti this. When the Lord speaks, we will all be quiet and we will see what the end of it will be. So hear what the Lord is saying. Yah says that things will not go back to baseline. Baseline is a basic settled level. And the way nations like it is that the baseline should be peace. No one should be releasing guns and missiles and nukes and sending forces over to anyone else's territory. Baseline, God says that things will not go back to baseline. So even the old resting points, whatever it used to be in the Middle East, it's not going to go back to that. The Lord says that the political climate will not go back to the polite tolerance of the Arab nations who used to only watch. Instead, things will escalate to the point where people who are not nearby to the conflict at all will involve themselves. And the Lord gave the name here, Egypt. Egypt is not immediately in the Middle East like Bahrain is and like Saudi Arabia is and like the Emirates are. Egypt's not necessarily there. Egypt is there at the top of Africa. But God says that even Arab countries or countries that have a large Arab and Muslim population that are not nearby to the conflict at all will involve themselves such as Egypt. Egypt will say, and I'm quoting here, an attack on one is an attack on all. Egypt will say they, meaning Israel are destabilizing the region and it affects me. That's why I'm getting involved. Egypt is going to side openly with the Arabs and say that an attack on one Muslim is an attack on all Muslims. The next thing the Lord said was that the Jews who are in Israel are not the rightful owners of the land of Israel, and they will be driven from there by the aggression of the Arabs against them. They will be driven out of my land because they are not the rightful holders of the promises I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are imposters and their true nature will be exposed before the whole world, even as the real nature of my people will be revealed before the whole world. 
their crimes, speaking of Jews, that the Lord has also called Yehudim by their own tag, that is what they call themselves, Yehudim, their crimes will be exposed and they will come out of my inheritance because I did not give it to them. So it is well known that the Lord sees the land of Israel as his own inheritance. He sees that as his own land, his own place, and he gave this land by promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now God says that they're imposters living in the land, people who are falsifying the truth, that they are Jews when they are not. And I will read you here from Revelation chapter 2 and 9. It says, I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So that is the first of two verses that the Lord gave me when I was doing the Yehudim series, which I finished about a month and a half ago. The second verse can be found in Revelation 3 and 9, and it says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So we see congruence here. We see both in 2.9 and 3.9 that God is clearly saying that there is a group of people who claim that they are Jews but they are not. So this is not, I'm not reading from a magazine. I'm not reading from an almanac. I'm reading from the new King James Bible. And the Lord is stipulating here in his Bible that in the earth at the end time, there will be a group of people who go around saying that they are Jews. They're going to go around having Judah's practices or Judaic practices. Should I say they are going to name themselves by the name Jews, and they are going to lay claim to the birthrights and inheritance of God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by saying that they are the people who have dynamically and in a direct line of inheritance descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they are not Jews. He also calls them a synagogue of Satan. So a synagogue is a place of worship. And there's only one group of people on the earth today who worship in synagogues. And that is the Jews who are currently in the political state of Israel. They are the only ones that are known to worship in synagogues. But the Lord says that this is a synagogue of Satan, which means that God does not claim these people. Let me just, let me just make it as simple as possible. God does not claim these people. God does not recognize the people in Israel as his people. God has disavowed them when John, the revelator was still alive, which was thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. He made it clear to his servant, the prophet John, that this is a group that worship Satan. Their practices, their inner nature, their heart, their behavior, and what motivates them is closer to an enclave, a group of people who worship and keep the practices of Satan, than it will ever have closeness with me, the Lord Jesus Christ. They say they are Jews, they are not. They are a synagogue of Satan. They say they are Jews, but they are a synagogue of Satan, and they lie. God says, I will make them to come and worship at the feet of those so people can know that I have loved you. So here we go back to the prophecy. God says that the Jews in Israel are imposters and in time he's going to expose their entire nature, their true nature to the whole world. And at the same time, he said that he will reveal the true nature of who his real people are to the whole world. So I've always stipulated here that when truth is brought out in the American space, there's always the tennis rackets and ready to hit that truth back to a person. But please bear in mind that on this channel, nothing is being hit back to me because I'm speaking exactly what the Lord has given me. And therefore, if you want to play tennis with Jesus Christ, I'm going to go ahead and let you. So even as people rise up to try and stifle this truth, oppose the truth, complain about the truth, call the truth racism, hatred, black supremacy, whatever, terms are being sent to me in the email. None of that matters because God is going to take this thing up himself. Imagine when the Holy Spirit, when the Lord God empowers perhaps groups, empowers people who have very large platforms. I'm speaking about global platforms, empowers political leaders such as Vladimir Putin, who has recently done this, um, a few weeks ago, empowers people who have a platform that is undeniable 
to start speaking this thing out. And then imagine on top of that, when the Lord begins to turn the hearts of people, for we know that the hearts of the king are in the hands of God. When the Lord begins to turn the hearts of the people around the world, as has already started happening, as people have been watching the abject cruelty of Israel, and their deeds are exposed. No longer are people holding back in condemning that deed, in condemning the things that they do. No longer is it hush, hush, and you can't speak and you can't say this. So yes, here in America, we have a last ditch, desperate effort by those who are in the house and those who are in the Senate to continue towing the party line, probably because those people are terrified of losing their seats if they say anything against Israel. That's your job. That's your lifetime tenure. That's all the money you have access to steal. So yes, they do have motivations to tow the line, but God is going outside of the normal parameters and he will definitely kick up strong winds that are going to bring things exactly as you are hearing here. God says that the Jews have crimes and those crimes are going to be uncovered. And if you remember, between January the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, I received several dreams from the Lord that I then published on January the 4th. And then a few days later on January the 7th or 8th, um, there was a huge hubbub here where a Jewish synagogue, I think it's Chabad or Kabad, was raided. And then all of a sudden, that's when we here in New York found out that they have little rat tunnels all over the city. And then we were treated to the sight of Jews running away from that police raid, running under the city, and then coming, popping up all over the city through hidden tunnels that most people, the majority of people, did not know that they possessed. And due to the beauty of social media sometimes, people were able to capture those exits from underneath the city live, post them all over social media, and in true Western media form, this story was not covered as it should have been covered. If such a story broke in the United States that Muslims had access to, to tunnels all, all through New York City, one of the busiest cities, it may not be the top political city, that's DC, but definitely if it was found out that um, so-called jihadists or ISIS or Muslims or any of the other groups that America has designated as the boogeyman had access to tunnels that radiate all under New York City, we would see it getting the same kind of coverage that 9-11 got, but there was barely a peep in the news. TikTok did a better job of covering that story than the mainstream media did. Shortly after that, rabbis began to talk, they began to talk, and one rabbi was caught and exposed for selling children's foreskins on there's a website, Craigslist, and he was selling them as food items and people were buying them. He was exposed. Rabbis begin to talk. They've been talking. They've been exposing the sexual molestation. They've been exposing um, the internalized trafficking of young children, marrying off of children who are way too young to be brides. This is not a child bride country. Everybody in America feels that the child bride nest is strictly the purview of the Muslims. And yet it's happening here in this community, but a blind eye is being turned to it. You might as well know that here in New York city, Jews have a separate police force. America was up in arms when we discovered that China has a separate police force here in, in New York city. China has a separate police force that operates outside of the NYPD, separate cops, separate cop cars. But did you know that here in New York cities that Jews have Panda cars that are marked almost identically to the NYPD and that they are allowed to operate with impunity as a separate police force to police their own community, to have almost identical powers to the cops? And it's very rare for the cops to venture into those um, communities. I only found that out this year and I've seen them with my own eyes. So we have cops and then we have cops in New York City. And so this is what the Lord is saying that there are crimes in this community and they will be exposed internationally. And the last thing that God has said emphatically, and I now repeat without holding back, is that the false Jews will come out of his inheritance. That will be Jerusalem, Temple Mount, all the surrounding areas that he sees as his inheritance. Because simply put, he said, I did not give it to them. 
I am Celestial, and this is the Master's Voice Prophecy Blog, where we do not accept political money and we do not work for anyone else except the Holy Spirit so that we can have an unbought spirit, we, I mean me, and speak the word of the Lord as I have been given it. This is the prophetic channel that the Holy Spirit, the Lord Yah, raised up in May of 2019. The date is May 29, 2019, and in another month, this channel will be five years old. This channel has been raised up by the Lord to put forth the prophetic words that I receive of the Lord starting from the year 2012 when God spoke to me and told me, my daughter, we are in the last days and I am calling you and choosing you to prepare a people fit to meet me all the way up to where we are now, April 2024. I'm bringing forth the word of the Lord as I receive it, as I journal it, as I keep it in my notebooks and my prophetic journal. And so may the Lord be with you. And the Lord has been saying this quite frequently, that this is not a toy. This is not a toy conflict that is coming. So don't let any man deceive you. First thing, as I made reference in this video, learn to read the word of God for yourself. Most of us in this country, this is a very powerful imperative. You need to repent. You need to repent for the lies that you have received and you have inherited from the so-called spiritual fathers that led this nation once upon a time. At some point, America stopped preaching the word of God as it is, and people began to preach their own opinion from the pulpit. So whenever the general political feeling was the Arabs are our enemy, then that's when you'll start to see back, I think in the seventies and eighties, that's when you start to see a lot of preaching about mystery Babylon and mystery Babylon was just, it was just chosen to be Iraq. Of course it was chosen to be Iraq because Iraq was the big boogeyman on TV at that time. And then after a while now we have new boogeyman. We have the dragon. Everybody's interpreting the dragon in revelation 12. Instead of Satan, Satan has been kicked to the curb because now the dragon in the Bible is China. Why? Because that's America's fear. I urge you, if you are outside of the of the United States. You need to return to the word of God. If you have received corrupted American doctrine, you need to repent to God. And the reason you need to repent is because you are responsible. You are responsible for the purity of the doctrine that you eat, and you're responsible for the purity of your faith. If you have a perverted faith, I can guarantee you 100%, 1000%. It is coming from the fact that you have a perverted doctrine. And it is so hard for those who actually speak the truth to be heard. You find out the truth. You want to share it with your family. You want to share it with your friends. Your friends are telling you, no, it's not like that. But that's because they've been listening to Pastor Hagee. They've been listening to Pastor Copeland. They've been listening to TD Jakes. They've been listening to all the people that have been there for so many ages entrenching these false doctrines. And now it's like wisdom teeth. Wisdom teeth are very firmly rooted. They're so hard to get out. You need to receive anesthetic to get those teeth out. They're very firmly rooted. They cause so much pain that many people, your spiritual identity is rooted in the lies that you know. This is why when people begin simple conversations with you, telling you what God is actually saying, telling you what's actually going to happen, such as the fact that you're not going to get an instant rapture, you're not going to get a pop tart rapture, pop tart rapture. You're not going to pop out of this world like toast that is suddenly ready. Ding. And then you're in heaven and you're at the wedding supper and you're part of the innumerable multitude. There are so many things that still have to happen yet. You heard in this prophecy about the rise of, um, the two witnesses, how God gave a dream, just showing the death of one and how fallen and filled with iniquity the world was and how much they hated God to the point that when this holy person died. They were relieved as if they had escaped some kind of three-year prison sentence. And so there are many things yet to be seen. The Bible tells us clearly that we will see the abomination of desolation, and that's the time that we are to flee. So then, all things being equal, why do you believe a corrupted truth? Just because you have been taught corruption, you will not escape judgment of the Lord. You will not escape being judged for having a false apprehension of the word of God. You are responsible. If you have inherited lies, you must cry out like the prophet said, Oh God, this people are destroyed. They have inherited lies. You have to repent to the Lord that you were not a good steward of your faith. You were not a good steward of the teething methodologies 
that you grew up in. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter that you sit and you might listen to what I'm saying and think it doesn't harm anyone. It harms someone. The person it directly harms, the person it directly puts in jeopardy of going to hell because you will believe corrupted things and you cannot stay on the narrow road with corrupted beliefs. The person who's harmed is you. It's not me. The things that I have are true things. They're precious things. The amount of sleep that the Lord is taking away from me at this time. The Lord spoke to me yesterday and told me very clearly when you receive your prophecies put them up immediately or they will overtake you as you can clearly see as I'm saying this thing there will definitely be a cache of people who think oh it's because she saw rockets going off last night no I'll be honest the dream that I'm telling you about I received early this morning no there were no rockets going off about the two witnesses God is simply telling us where something that TV is telling us in the case of the Arab conflicts TV is not speaking of the coming of a serious war that is going to act as a cord around the foot of the United States. America, you're going to be tripped up. It is inevitable. You are going to be tripped up because of your tendency to go here and there throughout the earth, thinking that you are the global moderator of peace, thinking that you are the only one who has answers and solution to when the nations are going through their turmoil because you were part of the creation of this false state. Americans need to understand that the people in power are set on protecting what they created. If you create a Frankenstein, when Frankenstein begins to tumble a little bit, guess what? You are forced. You have no choice but to go and try and prop him up because he is the creation of your own exalting, self-exalting self -exalt, self and twisted mind. So because of that, you have no choice. And in fact, here, I'm going to add one last dream that I received. I think it would be, it's either the 10th or the 11th. Definitely, this has been a week of fasting for all of us here at the Master's Voice Prophecy blog. And so this has been a week, the whole week, Monday to Sunday, has been intense fasting. And as a result, I have been dreaming a clip, a minute. And here is one dream I had. I will insert it here because it directly feeds into how people don't take the impact of war, the impact of impending difficulties, impending hardships, impending threats to the stability of your personal life. Here in America, we do not take it seriously, probably because of personality, probably because of the way character is formed here. For whatever the reason, you who are wise, you need to know what to avoid. You need to know what to stay away from. And so here, the dream that I had, it's a very short dream. I've been having a lot of dreams of being on the run, having a lot of dreams of sometimes having to run from my home by myself. But also I've been having dreams where I'm just with people that I don't know. And so I was out, I was definitely not in any kind of city place. I was living maybe in the Midwest or somewhere where they grow large stands of these beautiful pine trees tall, dark green pines, not the light green ones, the dark green ones that have leaves that are almost fuzzy. I was in a kind of place like that and I was living with this family and we were all asleep. So it's in the middle of the night, everyone is asleep and suddenly something happened that caused all of us, it must have been some kind of event that made a loud noise because everyone in the house, including the animals woke up. I remember I sat bolt upright in bed straight from flat. So you lying flat directly into a 90 degree angle, sitting up in bed with flight instincts. What is happening? What is happening? And this family seemed to be a family that at least had common sense, moderate preparedness, we got up and everything, trying to get ready, trying to figure out what has happened, what is going on. And so this family already had bags packed, get going gear packed, everything like that. I had my bag and we were able to make a reasonably quick exit from the house. And so we get in the car because there's an announcement going off and telling us that the safe place to go is some kind of, maybe not a stadium, Remember in the dream run, the prophecy is called run. I said we were in a massive stadium that reminded me of um, being down there in Charlotte, the stadium that they have for their basketball team. But we were told to go to a certain place. And unfortunately for us, we were not near that place. We were not too close to that place or pretty far from that place. So for us, it was a two and a half, almost three hour drive. And so we pile into the car 
And this couple, this family had a little one. And in the dream, I just knew in my heart, her name was Little Maddie. Everybody just called her Little Maddie, Little Maddie. Little Maddie, at the sound of that noise and in the rushing and everything, Little Maddie suffered some kind of trauma. So the child's eyes were permanently fixed in some very big circle. The baby was just staring, staring, staring. Maddie would have been maybe five or six years old. She had a favorite toy. And as much as we were trying to be gentle with her, we also had to get going. But little Maddie had been scarred. There was a teenage boy between the ages of maybe 14 to 17, no, 14 to 16, one of those, he was there. And then the star of this dream, the most annoying human ever to be formed by the hands of God, a daughter who could have been anywhere between 19 to about 21 to 22 years old, People of God, if you end up with this type of person, you must really dig deep to find all your spiritual graces, all your spiritual gifts, every type of good gift that comes down from the father of heavenly lights, seek for that gift. Otherwise you're going to end up trying to fight this girl. We get in the car and we begin to go and the father is quiet. A man is lost in his thoughts. The mother is quiet. A very well-possessed woman isn't shrieking, isn't freaking out, but she's frazzled. She's a mother. She's thinking of her cubs. And then there's me, Celestial the Stranger. I get into the car and we all headed in this long three hour drive. Everybody has a little something to prep, maybe a protein bar water. We start going. And then this girl, she had had a dream just before before whatever happened had happened. So she had been dreaming and God, God was the one who gave this girl the dream. So yes, she had a dream and it was spiritual and it was just my bad luck that I was in this dream. So now we're driving and the car is mostly silent. The father's trying to tune into whatever he can tune in to hear if anyone else is making announcements, is the radio carrying everything. The car's somber and this girl is talking. Celestial, I had this dream and in this dream, I saw this and that and that. I hear now in real life, I can't remember what her dream was about, just that she kept telling me that the dream came from God and I was in it. And apparently in this dream, I was not too happy with her. In this dream, I was not well pleased with her. And of all the spiritual things that the Lord was pointing out to this girl, this is what she was focused on. This was the bee in her bonnet. Why wasn't Celestial happy with her? Why wasn't Celestial greeting with her, with her um, or grinning with her? Why wasn't I pleasant? And why wasn't I accepting and commending of her? And so she's telling me the dream and I'm picking up spiritual elements of what God is telling her concerning the times and the seasons. And we're in the car, so I don't have a problem interpreting the dream for her. It's not something that I like to do. People ask me a lot. I don't like to do it, but I can't. So I told her all the major themes. Dreams always have overarching themes, important themes. You keep dreaming and the sky is dark and yet the people on the, on the ground don't notice that. That is telling you that we are entering times of dark deeds, dark days, heavy days when the hearts of men will be weighted down. The fact that the people don't notice means that they're oblivious to the time. So God is showing you then that the general population is in danger. Why? Because they don't notice the changing of the season from light to dark. People like that will continue to live as they've always lived and they usually will be swept away by the multiple judgments coming at the end of time. So I'm giving her the heavy hitters, but she keeps going on and on and on about the fact that I guess I don't love her absolutely and I wasn't smiling in the dream and eventually by the mercy of God, we sleep and we get there and everybody starts going into this auditorium. The father goes, you know, and the son and everybody's taking their luggage and going in and I'm going in and then she stops at the base of the steps and she wants to insist. She wants to insist. Yeah, Celestia, I understand all that other stuff and I see now for sure that God was telling me this and this and this and it's probably linked to this and this, but just the part, like why were you angry and why were you upset? And I said, it's probably because in real life now I'm absolutely sick of you and I cannot stand you because you are old enough you are past the cusp of adulthood. You are no longer a child. The word teen is not in your age. You have crossed over, whether you like it or not, into the arena where the rest of us adults exist. And you can see that this is a high tension, high trauma time. Something has fried the electrical wiring in your little sister's brain. She didn't have anything to eat. She doesn't want anything to drink. And her eyes are permanently fully open as if she saw all the aliens in every movie that Steven Spielberg ever made. You're the older sister. Your brother's quiet. Your parents are trying to keep their wits together to keep you guys safe. And all you can do is yap, yap, and yap. And I am absolutely sick of you. So the reason that God probably showed you in the dream is because in real life, I can't stand you. Don't make this experience any more difficult for me than it has to be. And that will be the majority of people. I have told you all the time. And this 
this prophecy block is a place where you can count on this block being the one place that you will always hear the truth. You won't hear a half truth. You won't hear three quarters. You won't hear it sprinkled with lies and softness and hand holding prayers at the end. No, God has sent you a voice that has to prepare you for times of war, times of destruction, times of disaster, times when, whether you like it or not, if you are an American listening to this, you are probably going to end up in a country that you've never been to. And if you are not excessively blessed or not excessively wise, you may end up in a country that you would never choose to go to on holiday. It won't be your bucket list destination. It's going to be your, I need to save my skin destination. And yet at the time that is going to test us, try us and demand so much out of us. You are hearing of a little one who, as much as her parents loved her, as much as her parents wanted to protect her, they could not keep the mind of little Maddie safe from what I've been saying here for the last couple of weeks, a hard impact. If a hard impact comes in the middle of the night, and you have a little one who is between the ages of two to six or seven, how on earth are you going to prep a child like that for a sudden shock? What are you going to do? Take her into the yard regularly and set off firecrackers next to her all the time? Say, I'm toughening you up, baby, for the sudden shock, the sudden noise at night. You can't, you have to trust your infant to the Lord. But imagine this generation, the young generation that I'm always talking about, they can't keep their tongue. They don't know how to think under pressure. It's all about them. God gives you a spiritual dream. You get perhaps 90% of the dream. Who knows perhaps why I didn't want to interpret for her, why I was not pleased with her. I grew up knowing that, for instance, if I'm seeing my pastor in the dream and he's reprimanding me or something like that, I know that the reprimand is actually coming from God. So if you're dreaming of someone who is a spiritual representation of God and that person is not pleased with you, it should be obvious as salt that because in real life you're not doing particularly well. This person was the least emotionally in um, intelligent in the group. This person was concerned about herself at a time when community and family should come together as a very powerfully cohesive unit to figure out what is the family going to do? How do we insulate the weakest among us and then move as a unit? And then I have always warned you, you will have these me, 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 but what about me, humans next to you? This is the dream the Lord gave me. And when I woke up, I was frustrated by it because I have many different dreams, many different dreams showing many different things. And I cannot bring all my personal dreams here just to show. I don't know those people. I know that God was just showing me that there are people who are, they seem a little bit self-centered now, but let there be a hard impact. Let pressure come. They're going to go from being a little bit of a nuisance to an absolute nightmare. The kind of person who will start crying in the forest because they're having Starbucks withdrawal and we're supposed to care. I'm cold, like we're not all cold. I'm thirsty, like we're not all thirsty. These people do exist and they're going to be there. And if you are a Christian, you're a child of God, you need to be able to widen the scope of your understanding very wide to ask yourself, what are the important variables? Keeping my head, keeping a cool head, okay. Keeping my peace, okay. Learning how to move away from distractions and things like that. But some things are unavoidable. It's not as if I could tell the father, would you tie me to the bike rack at the top so I won't have to hear your daughter yap? And at the same time, I can't just tell her to shut up over a three hour drive, stressing everybody in the car for nothing. But in the end, when her family had gone away and it was just me and her, I'm climbing the steps to go into this place and she stops down there. That's how I know we were in one of these places like Montana because there's moonlight and she stops at the bottom of the stairs and there's a beautiful stand of these firs, you know, backlit with silver because of the moonlight and also because of the floodlights in that safe place. So that's how I knew we can't be in New York. We don't have these trees. Then she stops there as if to demand, no, I need to know why you didn't like me. And I'm just said, I don't like you now. You're a thorn in my side. You can't read the room. So that's probably the missing piece of the dream. So I'm just sharing that. People are going to be scattered abroad in this country. It doesn't matter what the other people are telling you. You can watch whatever you like. If they are not telling you that you're going to run for it, then I guess you have only received the half truth, but here at the master's voice, you will get the full. God bless you. I am celestial. Thank you for supporting the channel. The Lord is with those who are with him. And until I see you again, goodbye.